Across the various shows that we have here on GMBN Tech, there's a lot of terminology and confusing tech terms used, in particular with things like suspension. So what we're gonna be doing today is taking you through a whole bunch of the more common suspension tech terms and explaining to you exactly what they are and how they affect your bike. So first up is compression. Now this refers to the way damping is controlled on a shock or a fork, for example, uh, specifically the way it's controlled when it compresses. The adjustment for compression is usually a blue dial or a switch. Now those with switches tend to offer two to three positions with variations on what they do, which tends to be open, mid and locked. The typical compression adjustment you do externally on a shock with these dials or these levers affects the low speed compression of the shock. Now the low speed compression adjustment can effectively be used to keep the bike more balanced. So for example, under braking with no low speed damping, the forks are naturally gonna to want to dive and that's weight transfer, that's what happens. But by adding some low speed compression, you can effectively hold the front end up so it resists that dive because that's movement at a low speed. That's how that damping works. And the same, if you flip this and talk about the back end of the bike, when you put low speed compression on the bike, it's gonna resist the bobbing that happens. Now, bobbing happens for various reasons, which we're gonna get into in another part of this video. But if it's weight related from your body weight and the sort of oscillation that you get from pedaling up and down, you can actually resist that by adding some low speed compression. And effectively, it stands it up and will make your bike feel like it climbs better. So just to summarize with low speed compression damping, less low speed compression damping, that will equate to a bike that feels very active and very supple under all sorts of suspension actions. However, it's gonna be more affected by your body weight and how you ride that bike. So by having more compression, more low speed compression on that, you're gonna be able to stand the bike up and make it less reactive to what's going on with your body weight. Now, high speed compression damping, of course, is the complete opposite. This is all about when the shock shaft or the fork itself is traveling extremely fast. So that suggests it's from a big impact or a fast impact. Something like bombing it down a trail flat out and you're hitting rocks and roots and stuff. That's when the shock or the fork's really traveling through stuff. And you need high speed compression damping in order to control that and tame that. Less high speed compression damping will mean your shock will feel slightly smoother, perhaps a little bit more linear, um, not necessarily true, but it will feel a little bit more linear. You'll use that travel more often, but you're more likely to bottom out at the end of that travel. More high speed damping can feel over damped and very, very harsh. And to a degree, you might not use all of that travel. So there's a fine balance to get to. Rebound is something that refers to the damping on a fork or a shock, specifically the controlled movement of the shock or fork extending, so returning from full compression. With less rebound, it's gonna be fast. With more rebound, it's gonna be slow. Now, normally there's just a single adjuster, uh, which would be a knob or a dial of some kind for adjusting rebound damping. Now, they will have notches on there so you can return it in the amount of clicks you need to dial in. Now, it's directly proportional the way you adjust rebound damping in comparison to the air spring. So a heavier rider such as myself will need to have more rebound damping in order to control that because it's got more air pressure in there in the first place, whereas a lighter rider will probably have far less clicks of rebound to tame it, to make it feel the same. Now, although there's no right and wrong, when it comes to rebound damping, you do have to get some things right. Now, if you have too much damping on there, so it's gonna be really slow, it'll feel really harsh, the shock will barely return in time before the next hit, and it will start packing, which is when it gets bogged down, as it is it's basically having to deal with repeated hits, and it's not extending in order to cope with those. So that is a bad situation to be in, but likely it's just as bad to have too little rebound damping on there, and you can end up on a pogo stick. Now, it might feel really nice when you're just coasting through something with, let's say, roots, loads of small bumps, because the wheel can track the ground really nicely, but as soon as you start hitting stuff hard, it's not gonna be able to control what's going on there. And to an extent, you can find yourself ricocheted off the front of the bike if you don't have enough rebound damping applied to control that.
Next up is lockout. Now it's quite a simplistic term and it, all it means is you're locking out the suspension from compressing. So you're stopping it working basically. Now lockout is the sort of thing that you're gonna want on your bike for example. If you ride up hills quite a lot, you don't want the suspension to be bobbing around to your body weight. So you whack that lockout on. Now on the inside of the shock absorber, there are a system of shims that the oil flows through and the shims have different size holes in them. Bigger holes enable the oil to flow through faster. Smaller holes will flow through slower. And when you close the holes, the oil can't flow at all. That really is the fundamentals of how a lockout system works. Positive and negative air springs or air chambers. Now, every air sprung fork has a way of putting air into the fork to give it a spring weight so it's sprung to your body weight. Now, this is the positive chamber, so that is to support your body weight. Now, a lot of forks used to have a negative spring, which was a coil spring, and the essential is basically to preload that air spring. And the reason for that is air, when it's in a compressed space like that, you have to overcome the initial resistance of that before it starts moving. So a typical air spring with no negative spring will feel very harsh over small stuff, and some, to some degrees won't even work that well. Once it gets moving, you're okay, it's moving. So what you do is you have a negative spring to apply a preload to that, enable it to feel nice and supple from the bottom. Now, most modern shocks and forks will have an air negative spring in there. Now, the air spring itself, uh, they tend to be self-equalizing, so there'll be an air port on the inside, and depending on the model of your fork or shock, when you pressurize them, you'll have to do a certain thing, like maybe compress it five times in order to, for the air to transfer in the transfer port from the positive to charge that negative chamber. So the negative air spring is effectively just a preload on the positive air spring. And the effect of that is you get a really minimal breakaway force, so you're not having to fight that positive air chamber. And really, it means that the shock or the fork is gonna feel a lot more like a coil spring, which are known for being very supple from the very beginning of the travel all the way through to travel. Pedal bob. Now, pedal bob is the sensation you get essentially from your body weight when you're pedaling. So, hence the name, pedal bob, always happens when you're pedaling along. But more often than not, it tends to be like an oscillation of your body weight that has a direct effect on the bike bobbing slightly. Now we're only talking, you know, five to 10 millimeters, but it's enough that it can rob energy because your energy that should be going to the pedals is turning into up and down movement at that shock. Now, some suspension designers will resist bob or squat uh, from pedaling a lot more than others, and they're the designs that tend to have a higher anti-squat value. As far as the actual up and down bobbing goes, if it is down to body weight, this can be controlled using low speed compression. Anti-squat. This is essentially a way around pedal bob, and it's pretty much a determining factor between bike designs of how some bikes will pedal better than others. When you pedal a suspension bike, it can have pedal squat. Anti-squat is simply the value to counteract that. For example, a bike with a 100% anti-squat value effectively means you're canceling out any squat, so you won't get any bob whatsoever when you pedal. Bikes with multiple chainrings will have different feeling and different levels of anti-squat depending on the chainring position and of course where the pivot point is in relation to those chainrings. But generally the smaller chainrings will have a higher anti-squat value. And that's actually quite a good thing because when you're using a small chainring or the granny ring, it tends to be in a high torque situation. You're really cranking to get up something steep. So having a high anti-squat value to keep the bike upright is actually really beneficial. Now, whilst high anti-squat numbers might seem really appealing, they do have some small downsides too. Now, really high anti-squat, for example, when you're pedaling and putting a lot of chain tension on, you're effectively pulling that hub down, which means, okay, great, so it's standing the bike up quite nicely when you're pedaling, but when you start hitting bumps, it's gonna feel quite harsh, and to a degree, you're gonna get some kickback in those pedals as it tries to counter those forces. Brake jack. Uh, this is also known as anti-rise, and it's simply the effect that braking has on your rear suspension that you feel at the rear wheel. If you compress the back end of a static bike, you might find that that disc caliper moves in relation to the disc rotor. Now, depending on the suspension platform you have, it's either gonna move more or less. 
the less movement it has, the less interference or the less feeling you're gonna get at the brake lever from using the brakes and affecting that suspension. The more movement it has, the more likely you are to, be able to feel this in a suspension. Now, the general feeling of brake jack or um, anti-rise is the fact when you're braking, it feels like the suspension firms up slightly. So it might feel like you have a slightly less grip at the tire. Some people get really, really fussy about this sort of thing, but bear in mind that when you're riding on very steep terrain, riding down a steep terrain, the times that you're gonna feel brake jack, you've gotta bear in mind that most of your weight bias is gonna be on the front brake. So any heavy rear braking you do, regardless of what suspension system you have, you mean you've got less weight on that rear wheel anyway, so it's more likely to skip around and lose traction. But that said, it's also a bit of a double-edged sword because arguably a bike with less brake jack it's gonna have that little bit more traction and that might be enough to keep you from breaking loose at the back end. But like I say, like really the more important thing in this case is your body weight on the wheel that's doing that braking. Typically, you will see more brake jack on a single pivot bikes like uh, an Orange 5, for example, and you'll see less brake jack effects on a bike like a Stump Jumper, which has got the four bar linkage FSR design, uh, kind of similar to the Nuke Proof bike I ride actually. Trunnion mount. Now this refers to a specific type of shock mount. Now traditionally all shocks have eyelets, one at each end, and you often hear the eye to eye measurement. That simply is the measurement between those two eyelets. Now on some bike designs, for various different reasons, you end up using a shorter shock. And what that tends to mean is you get less room on the inside for oil and shims and all the other stuff that leads to that nice consistent performance. Now by having a trunnion mount shock, you effectively get a longer shock, but it has the same eye to eye measurement. So you've got more stuff going on in the inside, essentially. Uh, and basically the bolts will mount directly to the shock rather than mounting to an eyelet that's on the top. A pretty simple system, really, when you actually just look at it. In the old days, GT used to use a trunnion mount that was actually adjustable. So you could raise the height of the shock in the frame accordingly and drop the bottom bracket or raise it slightly, uh, which is quite a cool use of that trunnion mount system. Piggyback. Now this is the extra little part of a shock, i.e. the piggyback of a shock, and it's essentially there to offer more consistency and performance. It won't actually give you any more features on a shock from a conventional body shock, it's just designed to perform better in certain conditions. Now a regular shock, you've got on the inside, to keep this basic, you've got your air spring unit, you've got the outer part of the shock, you've got the inner body that slides in there, you've got a damping rod, and you've got the oil and the IFP inside there. Now all that stuff going on on the inside is gonna get very hot in use. Now heat on the inside of a shock, you're gonna get an increase in the expansion of the nitrogen charge that's under that IFP, and also the oil itself is gonna get very hot. Of course, hot oil will end up running slightly thinner, which means you start losing damping characteristics. This is known as fade or damping fade. The idea of a piggyback shock is to increase the amount of oil it has and to move the oil in the IFP situation outside of the main shock body so it's far less affected basically. So it's not necessarily a better system, it's a more consistent system in more demanding conditions. Of course there's extra weight and there's problems with fitting them on certain bike designs so they're not for every system out there but they definitely do have more durability and more consistent performance when things get rowdy. Ah, so there we go, hopefully some of those tech things in relation to suspension have been answered for you. If you've got any questions or you've got any more that you want to know, let us know and we'll do an explainer on those. But we're definitely going to do a full in-depth, a really in-depth suspension feature soon, so keep an eye out for that on GMBN Tech. For a couple more videos, in fact, ones I did over on GMBN, click down here for finding out why you really should be riding in really good technical clothing. And if you want to find out how to look after that stuff, click down here. As always with the tech channel, please make sure you subscribe to us and tell everyone about us. And of course, if you like mountain bike tech stuff, give us a thumbs up.